Hello and welcome to What the Trans. What the Trans? Yes, What the Trans, a new bi weekly podcast by and for the trans community. I am Ashley Talbot. And I'm Michelle O'Toole. How the fuck are you doing, Ashley? Uh, yeah, I'm doing really. That was quite far mouth, wasn't it? That was, that, was, that was quite fun. We can be more foul-mouthed if you like. But yes, I am Well, fine. no, I just... I'm... My mum listens to the show now. Oh, and gosh. And the one criticism she had was we swear too much. I'm sorry, mum. I'm sorry. It's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I now feel terrible. I'm gonna. I'm. That's it. That's the end of foul language. At least until the end of this section of the show. Okay. Well, that's definitely good to hear. So, uh, yes, fine. Obviously, it's been a bit of a depressing week on the news front, hasn't it? Which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, but uh, really exciting today. We have us a special guest in the studio. The studio, which is also my kitchen. Um, it's a studio. So, We're professionals. It's a professional yeah. studio. We are totally professionals, yes. Um, so, from the LGBT Foundation as Advocacy Officer, am I getting that right? Trans Advocacy Officer, Trans yeah. Advocacy Officer, we have Cassie Peacock. Yep, that's it, Cassie. Yeah. <laughs> Cassie Smith. Oh, Smith. I mean, right. that's my actual name. That's your actual name. I see. I yeah. just, I just make the assumption that everybody's Facebook name is their actual name, which really, that gets confusing when I'm speaking to people like Zani. You know, I just never actually remember that their real name is like. I wish it was Cathy Peacock. That would be much more exciting than. Well, because then you'd be like a villain in Cluedo or something. <laughs> so. <This is> true. Accurate. <laughs> ah, uh, and yes. Uh, so. Cassie will be here joining us uh, for the entire show, but we'll be talking a little bit about their work within the LGBT Foundation, about advocacy, about outreach, and uh, about also the GRA consultation, but more on that later. How are you, Michelle? How am I? How are you, yeah. How am I? How am I? Oh, I'm all right. I'm good. Um, I've sort of, um, I've been sort of bleaching my mind because uh, getting in the news stories for this stuff has meant I've had to go down some pretty dark avenues on the social media back where, uh, back in the back of social media where all the turds and cretins are there <laughs> tweeting their snarky nonsense. So I've been uh, basically trying to bleach my mind with a regimented regimen of Stardew Valley and chocolate. And both of those things are very good at what they do. So yes, more, more Stardew Valley and more chocolate. Cool. Um, well, we'll have to sort of push for that in terms of inclusion in um, any potential new healthcare model for the trans community. Um, <laughs> chocolate and Stardew Valley. There you go. Yeah, Cass, take that to the LGBT Foundation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like being, I saw something which was like, must have been awesome to be a doctor in the 19th century. It's like, yeah, you've got ghosts in your blood. You should do cocaine about it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so... I think, unfortunately, we do need to crack on with the podcast, and by tradition, uh, the very first segment is the opening one, and it is terrible news, uh, and a lot of it is pretty terrible this week, so, and we start, of course, as we so often do, with some turf-based twattery. So, last week, a group launched an online petition demanding that Stonewall changes its approach to transgender issues and stops calling transphobic people transphobic. Uh -huh. So the petition was started by Jonathan Best, who is a former director of Queer Up North and is also an incredibly outspoken dick biscuit who's managed to bag a nice collection of fellow transphobes to join in on his stupid crusade, including Notting Hill and Gimme 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 actor James Dreyfus, Father Ted writer Graham Linehan, singer Alison Moyer, as well as all your usual rat femme types, quizzling nightmares and various argar owning cranks. So this petition reached just over 5,000 signatures at the time of recording, but despite that, Stonewall have categorically stated that they are not changing their mission to advocate for trans people, because of course not. Uh, so yes, the petition was disappointing, but I thought their response was pretty spectacular. Did you see this? Uh, I did, yeah. I, um, I had that usual thing where I see, like, I see this stuff rumbling online. I see it as potentially a stick that's coming to hit me personally when I'm like, oh God, oh no, I want to crawl into bed and never get out of bed again. And then Stonewall came out like maybe three or four hours later, just like, no, this is, this is stupid. No, just no, no to all of this. Stupid. Hmm. I saw that Alison Moye was a transphobe and I was particularly disappointed because all my 80s child yeah, yeah. disappeared down the plug hole. I think a lot of... 
a lot of people were upset that Alison Moyer's name was on there, but although it does look like she's backpedaled on it somewhat. So oh. she, she did actually release, release, so she released a statement the following day, Alison Moyer. We'll get onto Stonewall's statement in a minute, but actually, so the singer said, uh, in a statement on Twitter, last night at the 11th hour, I was asked to sign a letter to Stonewall that sought an open debate about trans issues and women's issues, specifically concerning women's spaces and perceived loss of agency. I agreed, though somewhat ill-advisedly, not because I was misled, I wasn't, but because I'm woefully underread on the points of contention here, which is actually it's kind of big to admit, I yeah. would say. Um, my personal position is this, I give the trans community my support, I take trans women to be women and afford them the same respect and dignity any soul deserves. I have no issue sharing a public toilet with trans women and do not feel any threat at the prospect. So I do think part of it, because a couple of people have on a couple of occasions when there's been one of these open letters, said, oh, well, no, they came to me sort of very, very late and I didn't really read it properly because it seemed like... It seemed like a lot of other people were involved, and actually, I shouldn't have done that. So I, you kind of wonder to what extent that was a tactical choice on the part of people who are pushing the letter. Like, oh, well, you know, let's make sure they don't really pay too much attention to it before signing it. Or, um, so, yeah, and yeah. also, but there is a thing where I think that this uh, backpedal may have been influenced by her agents and stuff who were just like, you know, you're not going to get any gigs of Pride next year if, you keep, if this keeps rolling on. Because I'd imagine that Alison Moyer gets a lot of money from Pride gigs, and like her people are probably just like, "What have you? What are you doing? What? What? What have you done? Oh God! Oh no! Look, you got to get off Twitter now! Oh Jesus!" Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure which one of those two things I prefer, um, really. But I just don't get why you would basically be transphobic and not think about what you were doing. Like, why would you just sign? hideous letters and not even think about it yeah like you, you'd, you'd at least read it fully first yeah. and then go well actually i don't agree with the substance of this so I don't, I don't know that's the problem when it's a back pedal it's very difficult to tell what's prompted it or how sincere it is um, yeah i mean i could kind of see how someone might be taken in by it if they don't know what they're talking about because like the wording of the petition itself was things like we want Stonewall to admit that there is a wide ver wide range of views on transgender people. And it's easy to read that and not realise that what they're saying is there's a wide range of, of, of views that are shitty about trans people we would like to be able to say without being shouted at. Yeah, well, so part of it was, like, stop calling transphobes transphobes. It's like, well, stop being transphobes, yeah. you know? It's like, if the cap fits, guys... <laughs> that's you know there's a reason that word is being applied it's not because of some conspiracy to brand you as transphobic it is because you are being transphobic that's kind of how this sort of, sort of thing works so did you see stonewall's response to this petition i did it made my insides feel warm and good <laughs> yeah warm the cockles of my blackened little heart so it did um no it was fantastic and it came out so quickly didn't it with just this you know boom beat down um, and it was, well, I'll give you a little example. We're proud of the work we do with trans communities to fight for trans equality. It is central to our goal for every lesbian, gay, bi and trans person to be accepted without exception. Trans people are currently facing horrific levels of harassment and abuse in their daily lives. It's a situation none of us should accept. Thanks, guys. At Stonewall. We are absolutely committed to continue our work to ensure all trans people, as well as all lesbian, gay and bi people, are accepted for who they are in Britain and around the world. And so that's a big fat no. You know, we're, we're not going to stop fighting for trans inclusion. We're not going to stop, you know, just because you don't like it because of your own prejudice and bigotry, essentially. It's, you know... Uh, yeah, what I love is the one, arrogance of it. Just like, we are, yes, going, we to, we are going to expect that Stonewall drops one of its main missions because of our petition. Like, Stonewall don't operate under, you know... Oh, well, if a petition comes along, we'll do whatever it says. Like, that's... If they did that, then Stonewall would have stopped existing in the 90s. Yeah. During yeah. all of the HIV stuff, you know, where loads of people were doing petitions against Stonewall because they were terrified of, you know, the gays infecting the kids with the gay. Like, if Stonewall were terrified of petitions, they would have folded, like, within five minutes of setting up shop. So, mm. oh. Yeah. It's this weird mixture of arrogance and utter dim-witted stupidity that I kind of like. I mean, I think the arrogance is definitely kind of edging it out, really, because, I mean, you know, just just looking at the list of names, I'm not going to bother reading 
uh, very many of them out. But it's, you know, if you're aware of this stuff, if you uh, have been following this ongoing sorry saga in the UK over the last few months, you'll be familiar with a large number of the names that are on this, uh, that are signatories to this open letter. Um, and it, but it's all, it's, it's really tiring, actually. And the fact that Stonewall have just so quickly responded suggests that, like, did you, did you have something ready to go prepared beforehand because you accepted the possibility that there was going to be some bunch of arrogant douchebags who assume they can change your longstanding policy with a petition? But what's that phrase? There's that classic phrase, like, the rights of the minority shouldn't be subordinated to the whims of the majority. And it's like, even if everybody in the country rights to Stonewall to say stop doing the thing with trans people. It's like, well, no, we're still not going to do that because, you know, the majority shouldn't get to dictate anybody else's rights just because they feel a bit squicked out by it or, you yeah. know, are jealous of all the amazing sex the trans community has. So. <laughs> and the sheer amount of straight people and, like, cis people on this list, like, you know, straight and cis, mm. and it's like, well, you are clearly, you're the people who Stonewall should totally dictate their message to, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> they're in charge. True, there are there are kind of more of them. But I think that the problem is that, like, if you look outside of a LGBTQ bubble, like a lot of people actually do genuinely believe this and are not understanding anything different from it. So I think that that's how that thing that you said it gets to function. Like, the majority is actually dictating something mm. completely. Yeah. So. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we need to like remember that it's not just. Well, well I like bubble. my bubble. It's nice in here. Everyone's I nice know. to me in my bubble. But we, but we want to win this. So we've got to think about like the whole picture. That's why I think over the next few weeks, because it's fine. Depressing, but we'll be sensible and reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Damn us. Uh, well, I, I mean, enough of that, I think. Um, details. Enough of being sensible. Enough of being... No, 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 no. I said enough, enough of talking about this... Oh. Another fucking petition by these people. Um, so let us move on. What have you got next for us, Michelle? Well, i got some good news. Uh, something that makes me feel hopeful for the, for the future. A new poll by Thompson Reuters Foundation has found that 80% of women... 80% of cis women think that transgender women should have the same rights as other women. Which is fabulous. The poll was taken in Cairo, London, Mexico, New York, and Tokyo. It asked a thousand women what they thought, and 798 of the women said yes to trans women should have the same rights as cis women. Only 37 said no, and 165 did not give an answer. Hmm. Not sure how to read into that, but I 80% of women think that we're okay. So who the hell are these people speaking for when they well, when they make their petitions and stuff? Like what is what are they doing? That 20%, that's the thing, isn't it? Because then spun another way, you could say, "Oh, well it turns out only 20% of people think that trans women should be uh, discriminated against and should not have the same rights." And it's like, "Do you know what? If it's in double figures, that's still a, that's still an upsettingly large number." Yeah. <laughs> well, it, most of that 20% didn't give an answer. Mm. Like, they didn't know what to Maybe say. It's just ignorance. Like, people literally don't know what trans is. That is a, That was an aspect that was raised in the report. Like, um, basically, the percentage of yes respondents grouped by location. Uh, Cairo came out with a lease with 62% of respondents saying that, that was okay. But then a lot of people had no idea what being trans was and had mm. to be had to have it explained to them according to the report. And the people, the, the place with the most res the positive respondents was Mexico City, which is surprising. Like they beat London by two percent. Like Mexico City, eighty nine percent of respondents said yes. London and New York, eighty seven percent. Yeah, I saw that, and that was I thought that was quite interesting. Um, yeah, you know, it's like just because you would expect it would be so. You know, again, this is us and our like. Um, kind of imperial privilege in a sense, but you just kind of assume it's going to be somewhere in in that sphere, don't you? That kind of Western, thought, uh, well, bougie yeah. thing. And I would have assumed like London and New York would be the top, but they mm. went by two percent. Yeah. So yes, I mean, it does. I mean, I know we were sort of cynical about only twenty percent of people think you should be uh, discriminated against, but eighty percent. So that is that does show how things are moving forward and particularly in i mean you know definitely london new york 
Tokyo, etc. It's like where there is a certain level of understanding. Um, and it does show progress, doesn't it? If you were to take this percentage, ask the same women again, or the same number of women again, uh, in a few years' time, you might find the numbers have risen. So, I would be interested to see a similar poll taken of people who of women who don't live in the cities, because hmm. there is yeah. always like you know you see it in America. Like uh, David Wong from Crack made this point that like the real division of society isn't necessarily right versus left; it's city versus rural. I would very much like to see the numbers of uh, people of women that live in small towns and stuff. Mm, that's fair. Um, I mean, you say you'd very much like to see it. It might also be super depressing. So let's not let's not be setting up a massive. Ah, <laughs> uh, I I know a lot of people that live in the country, and they're pretty great. Well, I, I yeah, but you haven't asked literally every single person who lives in the country, and that's where you. No, I've asked say. like ten. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I might. Small this is why I shouldn't get into polling as a career. I don't think I'd be very good at it because I would just stop at ten and be like, "Oh, it's all fine." <laughs> Uh, fair enough. Um, but so yeah, overall, I think good news. You know, steps in the right direction, and I am sure there will be more statistics as the years roll by. And won't that be something to look forward to? Hooray numbers! Anyway, um, so moving on, and oh look, another study has emerged claiming that there is a biological basis for being transgender. How many is that now? It's loads. Anyway, so this new study put together by the Hudson Hudson. Hudson, you secure that shit. No, uh, the Hudson Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne in Australia analysed the DNA from 380 trans women and compared it to hundreds of cis men and found key differences in how the brain handles sex hormones. The study was led by Professor Vincent Harley, who's got a pretty awesome name there. Mm -hmm. Professor Vincent Harley. Like, wow. And also, I just want um, to add in, um, he's got a very, very, a very, 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 very interesting job title. He is the head of Go Naddle Research. <laughs> nice. And I like Hi, that. I'm <laughs> Professor Vincent Harley. <laughs> I'm in Go Naddle Research. Like, I, just <laughs> marry me now, Professor Harley. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's weird though. Uh, yeah, like, I know. Professor on a motorbike. I don't know, and then go dance. That just sounds wrong. Yeah, that's true. Um, but he said, and we're going to assume here that he's not. He did not say this from his motorcycle. This is the world's largest and most comprehensive study examining changes in genes that control sex hormone signaling in transgender women. It's really specific, um, but it identifies several new genes or genetic variations never before looked at in gender dysphoria. So, something's going on. Somebody's found something that's statistically significant, but... I would again... want to see research into trans men and uh, non-binary people as well, because um, like this is only, like, all the focus is always on trans women with this stuff, and... You know, I mean, that's better than none at all, but, you know, there's a whole, like, other, like, just over half the community that never gets featured in these kind of things. It's always trans women, trans women, trans women. Yeah. You can tell there's a lot of, like, you know, straight cis guys who are just, like, in charge of this kind of thing and just fucking fascinated with us. You know, like me and Ash. <laughs> I mean, so that's that's always been the case. Yeah. But, to, um, I don't know if either of you have read it. Um... <laughs> Whipping Girl by Julia Serrano? I skimmed through it. Okay, I mean, so it's it's got some absolutely brilliant stuff in it, and it's got some bits in it where it's like, I, 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 I would not have written that kind of thing. But then I'm not an academic, so... But um, in the book, she sort of, I don't know, coins or introduces the term ephemomania. So essentially, um, it's kind of like a... Not reverse misogyny, because that would actually be something good, but as in, so it's an application of misogyny whereby uh, somebody who is perceived to be male, male gender, or whatever who is acting in a feminine way and everybody goes absolutely mad for it. And so the, the example is like, you know, non-binary and trans people just exist for hundreds of thousands of years. But as soon as Harry Styles from One Direction wears eyeliner, oh my God, gender is over, according to, you know, uh, mm. commentary and stuff. And it's like, come on, guys, you're, you're a bit too obsessed. And so that plays into why trans women are inevitably the focus of things when, and when actually it's like, guys, leave us alone. There are other members of the community. Um, you have the same problems and stuff. Why are you so obsessed with this particular struggle? Um, and we could probably spend an entire show discussing why that is, but we're not going to. Um, but you should be a good one. It's a good book. Um, mostly, like, 
Yeah, there are parts of it where I'm like, I'm just going to skip this bit. But, you know, in the academic sense, it is very good and it does sort of indicate a lot about how those uh, healthcare models were put together and the massive gaps that they leave. And so uh, getting slightly back to the uh, the story that we're supposed to be looking at. Um, yeah, the, the study like looked at 380 trans women, right? And it, all, it looked at a similar number of, tran- of like cis men what? and sort of looked at their brains and, you know, with magic and science. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's the difference if you're a dumbo like me who has no idea what about the science of these kind of things? What, were, they, um, were they, like, handling the same sex hormones? Because, I, like, if you're talking about handling testosterone or estrogen, then, like, they're going to be handled differently, right? So mm-hmm. I don't quite I mean, get it. I mean, it's you do kind of wonder when... You know, so science proves X, and it's like, well, no, that's not how it works, really. Um, I d- the problem is, is that it's a clinical trial, and they're they're really complicated. So there's probably something going on that I don't even have the structural language to express. Um, but I do, you know, you do tend to take these kind of trans uh, scientists prove trans X, whatever, with a large grain of salt, in the same way that you tend to with other science stories written by non-scientific yeah. specialist journalists. Well, it's like, what's their agenda? But I think, like you were saying, like that's the, the feminomania thing. Like, yeah, I can't remember how to say it. Like, it's like, is it like patriarchy tries to be femme, and everyone gets fascinated with it? I don't know. Okay, I've got some information. Um, oh. I've just uh, I've just done a little uh, look up on the Hudson Institute of Medical Research, and they are a non-profit, and they, this study took uh, it took place over the space of fifteen years. Oh wow! Okay, where they had three hundred and forty-two cisgender men. And three hundred and eighty trans women, and they were looking for a genetic, a genetic base for gender dysphoria, and they were focusing on twelve genes that produce and process sex hormones, including testosterone and estrogen, and the study showed, in quotes, small but significant differences in the genetic makeup between cisgender men and transgender women. Hmm. Interesting, but then I think. You just said this, Cass. Like, what's their agenda in doing so? Because the problem is, and I think I've made the point this point on on the show before, which is that people that you know, why uh, you know, so we're fascinated and we want to learn, and like, so why is trans? Where does it come from? But then also, like, what are people going to do with that knowledge? You know, so flash forward. So it's half past the future, and if your kid has a gay or a trans gene in them. Uh, we can see it beforehand, and so there would be some people that think, "Oh, well, that kid's going to be gay, so no, I will have an abortion." Kind mm. of thing, you know. And that's where the kind of eugenics question comes into it, because it's like if you isolate one particular genetic marker, which, just for the sake of argument, I actually don't think it is, because genetics is really fucking complicated. Um, but if say that there is that one genetic marker that exists then it would be relatively easy to get rid of it if we're at the point where we can identify the genes with that level of precision and so that's that always kind of scares me about these stories about seeing that oh well it's you know something since birth it's something we can detect in various theories about what it is or isn't and it's like well i kind of understand the curiosity but i'm really not comfortable with no the the potential outcome of finding out exactly what trans and gay and left-handed people are and everybody else isn't. I mean, I've literally never seen a trans person heading one of those kind of studies. Yeah. And if we're just like objects of curiosity, like, no, Mm. not there for it. Do more science, please. But like... I'll tell you what, they should be doing a study. They should totally be doing a study on what the fuck nacho cheese is. That's yeah. a study I can get behind because it's not question. cheese. It's not. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to pour cheese out of a jar. Is all I'm saying. It's horrible. Yes. Yeah. How do we get here from <laughs> there? Okay. Anyway, I think let's let's just move on before we start <laughs> listing our favorite. All right. We'll save this for the we'll save this for the cheese episode. Yes. Good. Lovely. Um, that one will have like really something music. Anyway, what's next? Well, in, in trans healthcare news, Dr. Helen Weberly, who runs the private trans healthcare practice Gender GP, has been found guilty of running an online clinic without a license. The service has been filling the gap being left by the NHS, 
who have been infamously overstretched and underfunded and has and it has provided a safe way for trans people to access medical treatment without having to resort to some dodgy websites like pharmacyonline.466.xxx or some nonsense. But it has earned the ire of the media and certain critics because it has been reported that Dr. Helen Webley has presi- pre- uh, prescribed hormone therapy to 12-year-olds, which I don't know if that means that they were prescribed puberty blockers mm. or like estrogen or testosterone or any of the other things. Like, who knows? I can't get to the bottom of it. So, yeah, basically, Helen Webley sort of been strung up, I think, for mm. providing a service. Like, her argument is that her service is not necessarily any different from, like, you know, any other private practice. But the courts have disagreed, and she's on the hook for an unlimited fine. Uh, she's going to get a sentencing on the 2nd of November, I think, and it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. And she did always seem like quite a, quite a strong advocate. Now, because we, you know, we've talked about this as well, obviously healthcare in the UK, famously bad for trans people, and generally within the NHS, yeah, you can go on the blockers before you're 16, you can't go on the hormones, and no surgery until you're 18, that's right. Um so it is interesting to hear that you know patients as young as 12 but then again it depends on who's writing up the story they say oh they're giving kids cross-gender hormones and that's actually Mm. not what's happening it's puberty blockers which have been you know used for as we've said precocious puberty for like 40 odd years there's been an ongoing study in the netherlands as to the use of hormone blockers and subsequently uh gendered hormones Within the trans population, that study has provided quite a lot of extremely useful information, all of which demonstrates that hormone blockers are perfectly safe. Um, so I don't know. It depends where the truth of this lies. Obviously, some people are really on the warpath for the trans community at the moment. And unfortunately... Yeah, when I was the... reading up about this on the BBC website, their story was something like, oh, transgender doctor found guilty of running unlicensed practice. And the Times headline was Trans community's favourite doctor found guilty of running illegal criminal practice or something. And it's like, wow, that's that's two that's two completely different takes. Yes. Well, uh, but there you go, that's that's the Times for you. Uh the journalistic integrity went out of a window a long time. Yeah, but the problem is this isn't the first time that um, the sort of UK healthcare governing bodies have actually censured somebody who is providing healthcare to trans people. Yeah. Uh, to the extent it makes you wonder, it's like, how come you're not clamping down on people that are offering other types? Of, I mean, maybe they are and we just don't hear about it, but um, it does seem a bit like... But she also just, she was saying she literally kept on doing it because she, it would... Like, people were at risk of suicide if she didn't. She has a duty as a GP to make sure that her patients are not harmed. So that's the position that they put her in, that to actually fulfil her duty as a GP, she had to break the law. Breaking the law. No, I know, and it, it must have been... I've got a tremendous amount of sympathy with Dr. Webberly at this point, really, because this is just a really terrible difficult situation for her to be in and it could sink her essentially couldn't it um yeah and they they think that the medical people in charge of this decision think that they're going to stop trans people from seeking like unregulated health care like if worst case scenario helen webley gets like a really punitive like i don't know one million pound fine which is unlikely but if it went that far and she had to shut down all the patients who were left in the wind. They're not just going to be like, all oh, right, no hormones for me. They're going to go online. They're going to go yeah. to some sketchy website based in Taiwan and order some hormones that, you know, could be anything, you know? Like, it's not... If this is really about patient safety, then they would have found a different way of going about this. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, that's... Uh, well, but. You know, yeah, damn it. All the best of luck and fortune to Dr. Webberly. Uh, we'll just have to keep an eye on what uh, what transpires next. Transpires. Transpires. Um, so, and our next story is, uh, although speaking of sort of court proceedings, Graham Linehan, um, famous Twitter user, his Twitter drama has become a legal drama as the mighty bigot in chief has been given a verbal warning for harassing a trans activist on the world's worst social media platform. 
the writer, who is apparently the same person who created Father Ted and Black Books, has been on a deranged mission to be as awful to as many trans people as possible, and recently focused his nonsense on Stephanie Hayden, who claimed that Linehan had personally harassed, deadnamed, and called upon his followers to harass her. She also alleges that he published her previous address, pre-transition photos of her, and other personal information. Subsequently, West Yorkshire Police have issued Glinner a verbal warning to cut off all contact with Stephanie Hayden. Um, so Hayden has said that she's going to sue Graham Linehan, but that's according to her Twitter account, so the details are a little bit thin as to what that means. So uh, there have been a couple of other bits of response uh, around this, but uh, yes, uh, Graham, what are you up to, you silly sausage? So this is like the third time in as many episodes we've talked about this guy. Yeah, I, I when I was when I was researching all of this stuff, I didn't want to put Gremlin in either, and I know you definitely didn't want to put Gremlin in. But I think this is important to talk about because if this goes to trial, like the Telegraph called this potentially the first dead naming trial, and nice. if it goes far enough, it could set a legal precedent as to whether dead naming someone is a hate crime. Well, so for people who have a gender recognition certificate, it is it is an offence to disclose that it's like a breach of privacy thing, and you can be fined up to five thousand pounds. But that you know, there are other circumstances whereby if you breach somebody's privacy by giving away this, that, and the other, you can be punished legally for it as well. So in a sense, in a sense, it already is a crime, isn't it? Um, if the individual in question has the gender recognition certificate, but it's still not a nice thing to do is the key thing. And I think the harassment element, more than the dead naming element, is the part that the trial is going to hinge on, really, because harassment is already a, a crime sort of thing. And I think a lot of the right wing press are saying, oh, it's a dead naming trial. You can you can get in trouble for, you know, insulting a trans person like that now. And it's like, well, yeah, OK, OK, for a start off, I'm totally OK with that. But also, I don't think that's actually what's happening. I think that's being somewhat blown out of proportion by basically Glenna's friends in the press. Yeah. I did read something somewhere that said that if you dead name if you dead name somebody or if you use the wrong pronouns for them or the wrong name, then you might be able to make a legal case that that is a form of harassment. I see. If you know what if you know that they're trans and you know their name and their correct pronouns and you continue to refuse to use them. I would describe that yes, that is a form of harassment. Because if you had that in the workplace, say, and yeah. there's somebody who you'd known before, but they just refuse, like, no, I don't care, I'm not listening to you, you're whatever as far as I'm concerned, and you're a, you know, you're a man or whatever. Uh, it's like, well, you know, no, that's that's not how this works. And if that continued, then yeah, that is absolutely harassment to me. What do you think, Michelle? Well, I mean, I think sometimes mistakes are made, obviously, and the right wing press would want people to think that, oh, you can slip up, call someone you have known for years under a name, that name, and bang, you get put in prison. But I think, like, trans people as a rule would be like, well, no. There's a difference between, like, you know, an uncle I haven't seen in a while calling me by my dead name, and so, and the writer of some of the most famous TV shows in British history screaming on Twitter to mm. half a million people what my dead name is. Yeah. I think that's... Mm. And I think it's obvious anyone in their right mind would be like, well, that's not okay. Because that's a malicious intent. Yeah. It, it depends on the intention behind it and what responsibility you have to that person, I guess. Like, if you have a job where you're meant to be protecting them or caring for them and you 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 get it wrong, then that's not okay. Like yeah. I've I've experienced this sort of when I was at a job I used to have, I had a supervisor who would repeatedly refer to me as Michael, no matter how many times I corrected them. I didn't matter. Michael has never been my name. Like it's just never been my name. I don't know. They like, just looked at Michelle and were like, "Oh well, they're Michael now," and they kept calling me it over and over again. Mm. And I think in that situation, that is very much what those laws are there to stop but yeah. you know at the same time it was almost impossible to prove that because well they were just like oh it was a mistake oh mm. i knew someone i know someone called michael <laughs> mm, but i think uh, i don't think 
I don't think Graham Linehan in this case has a leg to stand on when it comes to this kind of thing. No, no, and it has been interesting, sort of watching that sort of progression from uh, you know reasonably successful sitcom writer to kind of paling away into cultural irrelevance, irrelevance over the last ten years or so. Sorry about that, Graham, but honestly, you just haven't written anything worth watching for a long time. Uh, and it's now become this massive anti-trans Twitter crusade, and that's literally it. And the guy's hemorrhaging followers as a result of it. It's like, wow, dude, what? Look at your life choices. You know, is is this is this really what you wanted out of life? Anyway, um, yeah, we would have been done on the show, Grimland, after like when I did the dicker dispatch about him. Mm. You know, yeah. that would have been like last like last by week. I did that, and that would have been it. We were ready to move on. But now he's getting all legal and stuff. And legal stuff is going to affect everyone, depending on how the judge comes down on this hypothetical case. Mm. So we've got to keep talking about this guy. Like, in a way, I wish it was somebody else. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wish it was some other person who came out and just like and was in this, because then we wouldn't have to talk about fucking Graham Linehan anymore. Mm. I am really bored of talking about him. I'm really bored about talking about stickers. I am almost, almost bored of talking about the Gender Recognition Act consultation. But... Yeah, we need to. Yeah, we need to move so, on to the next thing. We do. Basically, uh, the final part of the news this bye week: the Gender Recognition Act consultation will be closing at eleven p.m. on October nineteenth. So please, everyone listening, go to www.gov.uk forward slash government forward slash consultations forward slash reform dash of dash the. You know what? Fuck it. Just go on Google and type in "reform of the Gender Recognition Act." <laughs> Look at the first thing, you'll click on it and fill it in. It's important that you go there. It will change lives, so go and do that now. If you need help filling it in, please go to stonewall.org.uk forward slash gender-recognition-act to get some advice on how best to fill it in. So, you know, I mean, you know, after the show, listen to the show. This is the show. Then afterwards, go, go, do, 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 go it's, do that now. It's super important. And there's a lot, not just Stonewall, there's a lot of other guidance out there. Gendered Intelligence have produced some. The Glorious LGBT Foundation the have LGBT produced. The Foundation has produced some. LGBT Foundation slash GRA. Yes. With a detailed guide that tells you, walks you through each question mm-hmm. and pointers about what the question means and suggestions for what you could put in your answer yes and that was actually so the foundation's guidance was actually what i had open in another in another tab when i was filling in the consultation so and i honestly i'm quite happy to sit here and repeat myself um until everybody else gets bored and goes home go and fill in the consultation it is really really important um but now i think it is time to move on and to our next segment, which is, of course, Gender Pop Culture Disorder. Oh, I've been diagnosed with Gender Pop Culture Disorder. I'm going to die of television. Ah! Ah, well, if, if either of us will, it will be you. Uh, so what have you got for us this week, Michelle? Well, it's a bit of an interesting one. Um, basically, last time on the pod, uh, I talked about the new ITV drama miniseries Butterfly, uh, being produced by and starring Anna Friel as the parent of a trans kid. And I remember saying that it would basically be a bit inert. It would be empowering for some people, but I couldn't see it being talked about much in, the, in a couple of months' time after it's been screened. I'm not entirely sure that's the case anymore because now a bunch of anti-trans people have started a sort of weird online campaign to get it taken to get it cancelled before it's been screened. Right. Like you've got, um, it's sort of been spearheaded by transgender trend. You know, we've talked about them a few more times on the pod. Uh, basically, a bunch of people that want to protect the kids from being trans. They're terrified that this will send out uh, the wrong message, uh, even though they haven't seen the show yet. There's also a few Christian fundamentalist types, uh, a few other cranks and stuff, who are sort of coming out against it. And it's just really odd that this is now... Like, this show, who which I didn't think was going to be any kind of big deal, really, it's going to become a thing now. And I think ITV kind of wanted this to happen. Because, <laughs> you know, controversy, blah, blah, blah. ITV. And the way that um, Anna Friel was talking about like how this is in the same roadhouse as when she kissed a woman on Brookside many years ago. Mm. You know, one of the great turning points of television. Yeah, it's just really odd that that's going to be a thing now. So I guess I want to include this just to say, watch the show, mm. I guess. If you weren't planning to, watch it, talk about the it. The show know. they tried to ban. Yeah, like, I think it's now... It's really annoying because now it's kind of our job to sort of uh, influence the national conversation. And something as inert and nothing as an ITV drama is now part of the game. It's just 
really bizarre. Yeah, and and kind of boring in a way. But I mean, so as we've said, you do kind of look forward to seeing Butterfly because I know behind the scenes it's been worked on by, um, you know, there's been sort of consultation with mermaids, I think, so that so mermaids have been working together with ITV to get this right. So hopefully, it will be um, it will be a good series. I still agree with you Michelle and that I'm not sure it would be one that would be remembered for the ages perhaps but we shall see you never know you never can tell what sort of cultural impact a thing will have um but well, we'll see we'll have to watch one will it. Be, so. yeah episode one will be out on the 16th of October um 9 p.m you know it's going to be a prime time thing like in all rights it should have been something that is basically is exciting for about a month and then we move on forever mm. in fact but now it's a thing. They've made it a thing. So it is a thing. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Wait. Again, a few episodes back, I was talking Wait. about... Sorry, what? Uh, well, you've moved us on a bit quickly, so uh, yes. Sorry, I'm all, I'm used to rushing through the gender pop culture disorder because we I try to usually keep this down to about five minutes. Sorry, do you want to go fine, on? That's no worries. Anyway. You know, it, I was just going to say it's weird timing because it's literally the day before the GRA consultation finishes. Mm. So why are they amping up the pressure right then who knows because they want millions of people to watch it i guess yeah so but i mean yeah the transgender trend or whatever i guess and they've uh, uh you know got got bored with ruining people's lives in the way that they've already done and have decided to try and ban a television show too because you know they just need to get a life and maybe a different set of hobbies anyway yeah. sorry uh in their twisted worldview they're terrified that the show like some parents are going to watch it and be like oh my kids like that mm. and then you know immediately they'll take them down to the transgender ch- the kid station down every road where they will be immediately injected in the bum with loads of hormones and stuff yeah that's... i mean that's what they're afraid of yeah. i mean they don't seem to realise that the Tavistock right now has like a three year waiting list. Yeah. But you know, whatever. You do you, transgender trend. You do you. Uh anyway, yes. What's next? Yes, um, okay. Uh again, a few episodes back now, I uh, talked about the Belgian film Girl, uh, about a trans girl who wants to be a ballet dancer. Well, it's come out in America on Netflix. It's not out here on Netflix, which is annoying for me because I wanted to watch it, but it's come out in America and the results are in. Apparently it is a bit uh, trauma porn, much like much of the films we watched in the last episode. Mm. Um, basically, Matthew Rodriguez for Intermore. Uh, basically, Matthew Rodriguez for uh, writing for Intermore. Intermore says, unfortunately, the film, which already won the camera door at Cannes for best first feature film, does little to explore the inner psychology of a trans adolescent and focuses much more on the physical. The film takes its cues from Black Swan and often feels like a horror film that conflates two journeys. The journey of becoming a ballerina, an unrealistic, idealistic form of feminine beauty, with the journey of being transgender. Put simply, the film is bloody and obsessed with trans bodies in a way that reminds us that a cisgender person wrote and directed it. It's trans trauma porn, and as a cisgender person, I'm warning trans people not to watch it, and cis people not to fall for it. Well, I'm not going to follow that advice because, uh, you know, the trans media is kind of my beat, so I have to watch it. <laughs> so, you know, the things I do for you, pod listeners, the things I do for you. But yeah, um, another thing that sort of came out recently was in a direct in an interview with the director, Lucas Dont. Uh, he basically came out defending the casting of a cisgender actor in the lead role, saying he couldn't find any trans people who could dance. Right. Which is the most bizarre claim I've heard for this kind of thing. Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure out there there'll be a trans person who can learn how to dance. I'm just saying, there's just there will be someone out there. Mm. And it sounds like a yeah, bit of a lame they, excuse to me. It really is. And he went on to say stuff like, "Oh, he couldn't find anyone to, you know, uh, embody the role who has the essence of the character and all this other stuff." But uh, basically, to summarise his point, he's an asshole, he's a shithead, and uh, fuck him. Yep, fair enough. Moving on. What's next? And I'm sorry for swearing again, Mum, but that is the only way words I have available to describe. I'm not that I'm not that literate. I have to rely on swearing because I'm a dumb person. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, moving on. Uh, another non-binary character has shown up in a kids' TV show, which is always welcome. Always welcome. But it's not really a kids' TV program. This is going to take some unpacking. But basically, there is a dark reboot of the Sabrina the Teenage Witch comic called The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina that's coming to Netflix. Now, 
let me uh i'm gonna have to break this down because uh it's a lot of stuff that's been adapted over the years mm. so basically at the start there was a comic in the 60s called sabrina the teenage witch published by archie comics the same people that do uh the art the archie comics yeah you know now later in 2014 Actually, no. Later in the 1990s, that comic was adapted into a TV show called Sabrina the Teenage Witch Star and Melissa Joan Hart, which I watched a lot of as a kid. Me too. And it was great, and yep. I loved it. Did you see it? I did, yes. I was. Uh, yeah, well, there's a whole story here about trans women and Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but please do carry on. Oh, yeah, that that I know exactly what you mean. Yep. Yeah, I love that show for yep. those, those very <laughs> same reasons. Now, in 2014, the comic was adapted into a sort of horror drama thing under the Archie horror uh, imprint called the called the chilling adventures of Sabrina. And that has been now adapted by Netflix into a dark gritty horror series called the chilling adventures of Sabrina. Right. Sort of in the same universe as the dark reimagining of the Archie comics, Riverdale. Right. And it has the same showrunner, uh, a guy called Roberto Aguera Sacasa. Um, yeah, it looks really interesting because it's got a non-binary character in it called Susie Putman, who's being played by Lachlan Watson, a non-binary actor. Woo! Extra points. And they will be playing a friend of Sabrina and the founding member of the school's Wiccan group. And also in the show to basically push it over the top as the queerest like kids <laughs> drama show ever, you've got Ambrose Spellman, a character who is Sabrina's British pansexual cousin. Nice. Who's going to be in it as well. So you've got non-binary, you've got pansexual, you've got witchcraft, you've got talking cats, you've got Lucy Davis from The Office and stuff as Hilda Spellman. You've got Miranda Otto from Lord of the Rings as Zelda Spellman. There better be a talking cat in it. And it just looks so... It's such a weird convoluted <laughs> yeah, history the of this show. Just to reach did, uh, this did, point. Yeah, did any of that make sense to you? Yes, yeah, broadly speaking. It's been around since yeah. the 60s, it's been made several times, and now it's The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. What's the problem? But yes... See, okay, I think this is the reason why maybe you should do trans... Uh, uh, Gender pop culture disorder. Yeah, that, because one, you know the name of it, and two, you can summarise what took me five minutes in a sentence. See, no, this is why uh, I do... Anyway. <laughs> that's why I do the news, remember? Anyway, you're absolutely right. That's this, true, yeah. This looks like it's going to be queer as heck, right? And queer so there heck. is... Yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of love for Sabrina the Teenage Witch in the queer community. I especially like the addition of the cat, like that just is the cherry and the cake. Yes, yes. What was his name? Salem. The yeah. cat. Yeah, yeah. He was very oh, smooth. yeah. Very smooth. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I look forward to that. I genuinely it's... do. I'm sure it's going to be the gayest thing ever, and I will squee over it and shower the entire room in glitter because that's what I do when I get excited. So. Yeah, I still can't get over, like, you know, in Riverdale, they took this, like, really twee American comic strip type thing and made it into this dark, gritty teen melodrama. And now they're going to do that with Sabrina. <clears throat> it's just so, like, it's genius in a way. It mm. is a certain kind of genius because, like, uh, Riverdale has been a huge success. Mm. And this is going to be set in the same universe. It's basically set in Greendale, which is, like, just down the road from Riverdale. So there'll be some crossovers and stuff. And it's just... So bizarre, it's like but in, I can't wait. It's like and obviously Yorkshire. all these dales. I well went to Greendale <laughs> High School, and now I live in Riverdale. You know, it's like well, this will be our adaptation. Yeah, yeah. Not Sabrina the Teenage Witch. It'll be like Sally the Teenage Witch. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yes, cool. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Oh no, it's all good. It's yeah. all good. That's pretty much it. So yeah, watch this show. It's going to be coming out. Um, yeah, it's going to be coming out about the end of the month around Halloween. I think it's coming out the 26th of October. You never see non-binary people in shows like this. Like, mm -hmm. I think the only other ones are like, um, well, Steven Universe, obviously. But what other non-binary characters do we have out there? Um, no, yeah, you take this one. <laughs> I can't remember their name, but I know it was, there is a big thing about it because they were the first non-binary actor playing a non-binary character. Right. Okay. Do you know the show? What was the show? Like, okay, so there's a precedent, but not much of one. That's yeah. the thing, is that because the number of times Michelle and I have had the conversation about trans actors in trans roles, kind of thing. And so for non binary people, the paucity of roles is going to be even more pronounced, I think. People just yeah. aren't writing them, you know, and that's even cis writers trying to do it and getting it horribly wrong. No one's doing it at all. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, this is 
It's great to see. Ah, uh, British pansexual. It's like, if, do they need somebody to audition for Ambrose Spellman? Because that sounds kind of fun, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, I could, I could be cousin to an American witch, maybe. Maybe I already am. I don't know, actually. Um, uh, no, I think we. I think it may be a bit of a push for you know you or me to try and uh, audition for the role of a teenager in America. <laughs> nah, it'd be fine. It's perfectly believable. Have you seen all those films set in high schools? They're all our age. The actors. Anyway, um, I mean, yeah, that's true. I could totally play a particularly haggard and world weary <laughs> teenager. Like, if the character is someone who has been through it, you know, had a few rough years, I think I could pull it off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, if nothing else, it, I would definitely like to see that. But um, I think, um, yeah, so I want to see this. I actually do. It's kind of because I'm not I'm not really big into Halloween and stuff, but Sabrina the Teenage Witch was such a core part of my formative years. Like, I'm going to have to at least give this one a go. Um, but I think that's enough of the transgenderous pop culturing disorders uh, for now. And I think we should move on to... The the meat of Cassie's appearance here with us today, and uh, we'll do the hot take. Um, it's, I do that in I do that voice every time. I don't think it works. I just started doing it, and now I don't think I can stop. Um, it works. It kind of works. Um, so yes, as you've possibly noticed, dear listeners, we have somebody else with us today. As we've said, Cass is uh, the trans. Advocacy Officer for Manchester's LGBT Foundation. Have I got that right? Yep, that's 100% correct. Awesome! I can read off a piece of paper correctly. So, it's quite new, that role, is it? it? It's been going for about six months. But, yeah, advocacy at the Foundation is a completely new thing. Hmm. So, what does that... So, give us a brief rundown, then, for listeners who might not be fully cognizant of stuff. When you Hmm. say advocacy, what exactly do you mean? It means... Basically, anything that gives trans people a voice, if they're if they're experiencing a barrier to a service, whether that be because of lack of knowledge, because of lack of confidence, or because someone that's meant to be providing a service to them is putting some kind of barrier in their way, um, like a health provider or an employer or um, like a, a shop or like a really broad range of people that are meant to be helping them we can help them to overcome those barriers okay and so that's that sounds like it's quite involved and you um particularly when it comes to things like healthcare providers because Mm -hmm. we've we've all got our own stories um of barriers being put up by people who are supposed to be providing things to us i mean so is that is that the lion's share of what you do or is there like a big mix of all sorts of people needing advocacy, which would be worrying in itself. There's a massive range. I mean, I think that we, before this job, this position started, we had Pride in Practice, which was already training GPs on how to better serve the LGBT community. So we already had a kind of different, we were coming at providing that support from a different angle in terms of healthcare. Um, so we do see... Um, a fair amount of healthcare inquiries, but we also see a lot of um, discrimination from like um, shops, cafes, bars in terms of like toilet stuff, especially. Ah, yes. Um, We see quite a lot of stuff about employment, um, schools, um, prisons, interactions with the police, um, mental health. Everything like, really. basically everything. So basically that, everything is broken and you've got to try and help people to fix it. That is that is not an easy job, Cass, I've got to say. That sounds pretty hard. <laughs> well, it's like, it's baby steps, you know, we have to, this is quite a new service and I think that maybe um, the like mainstream charities focus on mental health quite a lot, but the trans advocacy job allows us to look at, well, what is actually happening to those people in the world that is creating those problems. Mm. Because quite often people coming in in distress is because some service that they really need, they can't access. So, yeah, I don't think that many services are... There's like three in the country that mm. I can think of, three trans advocacy services. Right. I so I yeah, and there was none when I was coming out. Like <laughs> when I was coming out of my job, for example, I had to, uh, I basically had to Google the, the Unison 
advice. Oh, yeah. Because they were the only people, they, 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 they were the union and they were the only people that had anything on this. And I had to take it to my HR boss who had no idea what to do. Like when I came out, his eyes widened just like, yeah. I have no idea what to do now. Right. So I had to go yeah. in to get a printout to basically talk him through what to do. Yeah. And I think that's... And Sorry. that, I think that was an incredibly common thing, yeah. like back in 2013 when I was doing it. I believe you may be right. Yeah, I mean, I think that we see that a lot, that the people who are meant to be providing the service um, are oftentimes just ignorant about what trans is. They literally don't understand anything about it. They don't understand what their obligations are under the Equality Act, and they have to be talked through what the procedure is. So, um, like, obviously some of it is, at times it's to do with malevolence, but at mm. other times it's to do with pure ignorance. Mm. And one of those is kind of better than the other in that sense, because if it's if you've got somebody and you're particularly you in your role, you're attempting to advocate for somebody who has been the victim of malicious conduct. I can imagine that being much, much harder to get through to because they're not even going to listen to you as as an advocate. And we do see that a lot and sort of heard of a lot of stories about, as you mentioned, so these places that are supposed to be providing a service and then they're not doing that. And then if there's nothing like an advocacy service available, mm. they'll have to be their own advocate under distressing circumstances in a situation that has already caused them a certain amount of mental distress so yeah and that's what's so stressful about it is if you if you're just going through that stress but you have no idea about what your rights are how to approach it that that not knowing can be horrible and Mm -hmm. just having some idea of what you're actually entitled to can kind of give you a structure that that makes you feel a lot more in control of the situation. Mm. Yeah, no, yeah, makes sense. And so the project of the LGBT Foundation, the Trans Advocacy Service, as you say, that's they're not the first to have done that. Uh, like as a, as a as an idea in terms of somebody noticing that actually trans people are in need of. No, they they're not. They have one in um, Mind Out in Brighton has a trans adv- um, specifically mental health mm. um, advocacy. Um, and Gallup in London um, has traditionally looked at um, kind of hate crime and violence against LGBT people, so is working around kind of that kind of things, Mm -hmm. Um, legal side and and kind of connecting to um, domestic violence, hate crime, those kind of issues. Yeah, yeah. But so as well as actually being that advocate, being that person who will sort of get in contact with the organisation or whatever, there's also going to be a certain amount of outreach here, isn't there? Like, trying to connect through to service users who might be vulnerable. Is that a part of what you're doing, or is that something that's dealt with elsewhere? Well, I think that at this stage, when the service is just starting up, obviously we're putting a particular emphasis on people getting to know about the service. Yeah, yeah. Um, Over time, I mean... There's enough demand for the service that we kind of don't need to do outreach in that sense of yeah you know, okay I see yeah enough people use it but um, we definitely want people to know about it and utilize it and we also want to find ways to develop it that are going to be useful for the community so um, look out for um, ways that you can get involved. Um, whether that be through consultations. So just keep your eye on the um, LGBT Foundation Facebook and um, um, Twitter for that. That's something that I would advise people to do anyway, actually, because, like, you know, I would go to the barricades for the LGBT Foundation and there's actually some really... The way that the advocacy service has been started and is being run and the way, you know, Pride in Practice, the team that's specifically helping out with healthcare issues, there's a lot of quite specialised things going on in there to the extent that the foundation's kind of become a bit of a one-stop shop for a lot of places in the north, um, particularly with discuss- like particularly around healthcare, and that is specifically to do with the Pride in Practice team. So, yeah, um, Pride in Practice is awesome. Yeah, and they've been doing a lot of work that nobody else has... It's not that no one was bothered to do it, it's just that you know, an, a need was identified and it's now being very, very capably fulfilled. 
Um, but I wanted to ask you as well then. So um, the consultation that's coming up. A GRA consultation. The GRA consultation, which we have spoken of very briefly earlier on, the one that's up and due to be in on the 19th of October. And all of you lovely listeners should do the thing. Go to the government website, write the thing, answer the question, submit the consultation. Um, is, so are you coming across a lot of the related issues to that in your work? Well, we're coming across issues that relate to basically trans people not having any legal recognition has a knock-on effect. The thing that I was telling you about, service providers literally have no clue about what they are meant to be doing in terms of their responsibilities under the Equality Act. And um, whilst they're two separate pieces of legislation, very distinctly, um, we need like more legal visibility. Mm. People are not going to like service providers are not going to take that seriously until they actually recognize that trans people have these rights under the law and that they do have an obligation to uh kind of they have legal responsibilities yeah. related to that yeah i mean that makes sense so you know just to sort of bang on the gra consultation drum um the current law doesn't recognize non-binary people um which law Oh, so specifically, <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, specifically, the Gender Recognition Act and its related certificates. There's no, uh, there is no non-binary option, and it was strange reading through the consultation because it basically said, well, I'm paraphrasing here, but it said um, there has been no legal concept of a non-binary person up to this point, mm. which is completely bizarre and fills me with existential dread um, <laughs> to find to kind of see that written down but that's that's where we stand yeah there's so there there is just nothing which is why it's kind of double because for me when i was filling out the consultation there's that bloody c word again when i was filling it out one of the drums that i was hitting was non-binary legal recognition whatever is instituted in a changed gender recognition act that needs to be in it because those people exist and yeah. lack of recognition in law can cause all sorts of problems. Yeah. I was definitely quite more about that and having a rant every time one of those questions came up because I was like, ah, I can get all my frustration out through this consultation. Um, because just having no concept of being legal rec legally recognised can be so um, kind of disappointing but also, obviously, it has very practical implications for your life. You're not protected. I don't feel fully protected in law, and I'm not mm. equally. So it's a massive problem. Yeah, yes. I was incredibly surprised when I was filling in the consultation that there wasn't, like, I put in non-binary recognition in every box that would allow, <laughs> that it was right to do so, Good. because I was just so, filling it in just so angry, just like, why isn't this being considered? Mm. Like they could be, there may not be another consultation like this for another five years. Like why? If that, what the, mm. what the it hell? Took, it took what them long the, enough. Just what the what? Yeah. You know, it took them long enough to do this consultation. I think whatever the results of this consultation are, we are stuck with them for probably the next fifteen or twenty years. Yeah. So we want this one to go right. Yeah. And so you were talking a little bit earlier on, Cass, about. Um, people submitting to the consultation mm -hmm. and the the there are a lot of people submitting to the consultation who are arguing from the anti-trans standpoint yeah. and it actually looks to be quite a close run thing at the moment in terms of raw numbers so, so I, yeah i think that what are the numbers well um apparently they're about 50 50 for the the, the pro reform of the act and the the against reform of the act um, which the fact that a lot of this plays out on social media, people mm. might not be aware um, of what's going on outside their their friend circle. But this is why you have to get all you have to fill in the consultation and get all your friends to fill in the consultation and get them to get their friends to because it's a numbers game and yes. we need to make sure that we get the majority pro trans yes the majority sort of arguing for sort of good sense and compassion rather than saying no that freaks me out so i'm going to make sure it's illegal sort of thing and on that oh, note God, that's um, crazy yeah 
we will be having a at the LGBT Foundation. We will be having some kind of pizza slash cake party where we'll all be gathered around our laptops, um, filling in the consultation, and ah, there yes. will be people on hand to advise you about um what your options are and what things mean, and um generally make it easier to fill in. So that will be coming up next week. Nice. On Monday, cool. I believe. Monday, what? Monday 15th is that? Yeah. So if you're in Manchester, or are you in the Northwest, in fact, um, do pop along to that on uh, Monday 15th. Unfortunately, our next episode is only going to be going out the weekend after, the week after the consultation goes in. Because the consultation is due in a week on Friday, October 19th. And also, just in case she's listening, that's also your birthday, Mum. So happy birthday. Um, but uh, it is very important for everybody to tell everybody else that they know to fill in the consultation. Partic- you know, hit the points of recognition for non-binary people. Hit the point of less bureaucracy. Uh an option for under under 18s there's just there's just so much stuff that we have the chance to change now so let's 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 do it let us you know seize that um horse by the horns and um go for it go for it yeah that's the one it's just so weird when people it's just so weird when they do a civil rights issue as like a sort of referendum mm. yeah like, why kind of do they do that either. yeah it doesn't like with this when it comes to civil rights some people shouldn't have a say because they don't know anything or they think that this is basically something that's going to allow i don't know sex offenders in schools or something and they'll be like no and it's like well that person is not an informed mind Mm. yeah this person shouldn't necessarily have as much say as someone who like works for a shelter or someone who works for a charity who knows what they're talking about why aren't they talking to experts well, that's the thing is that I I do think they are, and I think that that kind of expert and kind of morally trans supportive um, stuff that's being submitted is going to be listened to, and I, it may well even be given sort of more weight because yeah. the thing is, we are the people who are arguing from a position of like empiricism and fact and science and things that have been observed, uh, and whereas the other people are arguing from a position of lies and bigotry and hysteria, and that I suspect will be obvious in the arguments that are being made. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's all a bit of a mess. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad the advocacy role is one that now exists. Honestly, um, I think it, so. I've you know spoken to a couple of people who've kind of had had some use out of it, and you know. Because I've actually known Cass for a little while, I can't think of anybody better to do it, so that's good as well. Oh, thank you. Um, but you kind of want to see that everywhere, right? You know, because we've got it in Manchester. There's one place in Brighton. There's one place in London. But there's a whole other country between those three places, and this is a relatively new, but not, I would say, novel idea. Because I seem to recall Action for Trans Health, yeah, um, had um, a trans advocacy service as part of. Uh, it's probably still going, in fact, isn't it? Um, yeah, which was something that needed to be taken up because there were so many calls and emails to the various contact points of Action for Trans Health for some people who did need an advocate because of discrimination or a problem with healthcare or legal or something. So you know the issue exists, and there's um, there's some good thinking and great work taking place, but not enough, not nearly enough, because it never is. Yeah, I mean, I hope that it will be. An inspiration, and I hope that um, it will I hope that other places will follow suit. Um, but having said that, we do have some capacity to be a national service because mm. one third of the people that I work with can be supported on the phone or by by email. So it's not just for Greater Manchester or people. That is um, good, actually. I was going to say about Action for Trans Health, I think it would be a good idea to check the website whether that app still running. is running at the moment. Okay. It does seem to run in phases, doesn't it? So, mm. uh, yeah, that's, that's probably worth checking. Um, before you start asking Action for Trans Health to advocate for you, <laughs> just check if that's something that's still being done. But I know that's something that simply because it's stuck in my head because of the people that were responsible for the advocacy service within yeah. Action for Trans Health. Well, they pioneered it, so exactly. that is 
Amazing. Mm. But it was also very stressful for the people doing that advocacy mm. role because, you know, so we were based in Manchester or Brighton or whatever and someone's got in touch who desperately needs somebody to, to help them in this way who's based in Scotland. And But then there's also in the inbox, there's a dozen, of, there's a dozen more of the same kind of thing and it's like you can't you can't help all of them there's no you know to to deal with everything that comes in to be able to effectively solve all of these problems it's the work of several lifetimes of no sleep yeah you know i mean i think that my other hat i wear is that i'm a a therapist and Mm. you learn about boundaries pretty soon in that i think that trans people sometimes feel like they have to look after everybody else because in their community because they can see the shit that's going down but I really believe it's important to look after ourselves as well and, and kind of ask for support when you need it mm. and I just I, I'm, I'm feeling personally attacked by this content right now, <laughs> I have to say <laughs> but the point is is that this idea has been sort of picked up by slightly more mainstream organisations LGBT Foundation um so all power to you and carry on doing the awesome stuff and look after yourself uh, <laughs> thanks do my best nice. yeah, practice what i preach yeah yeah absolutely um okay so i think we'll wrap this bit up is there anything you particularly would like to say at this point while you've got the chance if you want to find out more about the advocacy service go to lgbt.foundation slash how we can help slash there you go perfect thank you very much um okay yeah Cass thank you for your service pleasure yes. thanks for inviting me to your amazing podcast uh, <laughs> well I was I was talking about your service as an advocate not your service as coming onto this podcast <laughs> although thank you for that service too yes <laughs> thank you for your wit and snark and, and all the stuff that you know so um Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so rattling into the final two bits of the show. Traditionally, uh, it's the dickhead dispatches. Well, Percy Parker is a dickhead. Who is she? Ah, yeah, I should probably explain more, shouldn't I? Maybe. Well, she's the head of a pressure group called Standing for Women, a group who think that the biggest threat to women right now is less than 0.5% of the population. And not any of the actual things that mess with women every single day, like the wage gap and sexual assault and the tampon tax and all these other things that actually affect women multiple times a day, every single day. No, it's the trans people that are her issue, it would seem. But what makes her especially dickheadish is that she is someone who is very, very much against the sex industry. She hates pornography. She hates sex work. She hates all of that stuff, which, you know, that is a point of view to have. But... What she's done is she put one of those billboards up, those anti-trans billboards saying uh, female is adult human female or whatever, right on a sex shop in Birmingham. So she clearly has no problem giving the sex industry money if it means that she gets a chance to bash trans people, which I thought was especially dickheadish to, you know, run over your own morals to in the service of being a bigoted, hatred-filled dickhead. So yeah. Parker Posey is our dickhead of the bye week because yeah. she is a massive dickhead. That's fine. And dickhead, dickhead, dickhead. And uh, again, I'm quite happy to repeat that forever until she just sort of uh, disappears. I do wonder, like, I, something occurred to me earlier this week where it's, <clears throat> you know, what was the advert? Uh, woman equals adult human female. And it's like, Posey, the only people that would describe a woman that way are the Daleks, right? You know, <laughs> alert, human, female, detected. It's like, you know, you're not coming at it in a particularly... Uh, human or empathic way. Yeah. So. It's just like, you know, um, what's the... Um, so the point is, someone, you know, she spent her own money putting up these stupid fucking billboards above a sex shop. And you just, it's just, it's so inconsistent and incongruent that you can't help but kind of laugh at her. And call her a dickhead, because she absolutely is a dickhead. So uh, that's enough. Good. Well done, Posey. The best part of that whole thing, though, is that anybody who's seen this who doesn't know the context behind it, just like, well, yeah, that's a dictionary definition. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know what that means. (laughs) Why is that up there? Someone Is that... Like, putting that above a sex shop as well, it's just like... (laughs) I'd imagine people know what they're looking for in a woman if they're going into a sex shop. You know? Yes. 
Uh, it's just such a very, very strange thing to put up, and it's very much only entirely for people who already agree with her or yeah. people that already hate her are only going to get that message. Yeah. It doesn't even work as an advertisement for her movement. It's so weird. Yeah, I know. It's just it's just absolutely nonsense, and one hopes once the GRA consultation, thank, fingers crossed, if it goes our way, then she will just shut up and you know, fall into irrelevance like the rest of them. But that's well, enough. I'll never shut up, but hopefully they'll stop pointing microphones at her, at her face, yeah. you know? <clears throat> that's true. Um, but that's enough of that, I think, because Posey Parker and her ilk can all just sort of fall off a cliff as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, finishing off with something nice, as we always do, which is our hero! Yay! Yay! Be my hero, baby! Heroic music. I don't know, that sounded like jazz. So this week's hero... <laughs> Yeah, so this week's heroic someone is actually several someones, a whole organisation of them, in fact. So we mentioned them earlier for their epic takedown of the petition demanding that they stop being trans-inclusive and working on trans issues. It is, of course, Stonewall. The response to that petition is well worth a read, dismantling as it does their entire line of argument with a simple few paragraphs. So well done, Stonewall. Genuinely impressed. And you are hereby bestowed one unit of podcasting glory. Do enjoy it. Don't spend it all in one shot. Please carry on supporting us because it feels like you're the yeah, Ruth way. Hunt was like Ruth Hunt went on to Radio 4 uh, debating inverted commas mm. with the guy who made this whole petition thing happen. And she was just a boss, just like, <laughs> like he was there saying, like, look at all the conversations that are happening about these that are being silenced. And she was like, well, I don't know how much power you think Stonewall have, but we don't have the power to stop, you know, everyone who's being nasty on Twitter. We don't have that power. I like that. Yeah, it was good. I was I was really just relieved and delighted and, and whatever else to see them actually taking a stand in a sort in this sort of a way. And so effectively too. It was fantastic. So more of that please. Um just just generally, not just in response to hateful petitions. But I think that's all the time that we've got for, and so I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, so thank you very much, Cass, Trans Advocacy Officer from the LGBT Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us. And we will be back in two weeks' time. Yeah, until then, uh, check out our Twitter, uh, at what the Trans. Check us out on Facebook. Uh, do all the internet things. Tell your friends about the podcast. Fill in that consultation. Tell your friends yeah. to fill in the consultation. Yeah, the show's over now, so you can go and do it. Go. Yeah. You're only gonna miss like you're only gonna miss the exit music. You know. And you know that's what that not sounds like. You know, it's the same yeah, I made that on iTunes. I made that on. I made that on Garage Band in about eight hours. Okay, you should... know, it's not worth it. Your time. Go do the. Go do the. Go do the consultation. And then tell your friends to do the consultation. And then tell your friends to tell their friends to do the consultation. This one, it's this is this is really important. This is our last chance to say it. Do the consultation about the Gender Recognition Act. We can make things better for all of us for a long time. And with that, good night. Mic drop. Bye. 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 Bye.